Moving on. <laughs> okay, so our next, our next set of objects all come from the Aztec Empire. Or as I, as I said before, the Aztec called themselves the Mexica, the Mexica Empire. Okay, so those two terms are synonymous with each other. And the Aztec Empire flourished late, okay, in, in what's called the late post-classic period and between 1345 and 1519. So this is very late, okay, so this is right, um, 1519 being the date that the Spaniards arrive in Mexico, okay. Um, before I get into the Templo Mayor, I just wanted to mention that the Aztecs themselves were savvy historians and constructors of their own identity. They were, they were smart about the way they sold themselves and how they rose to power and flourished so quickly. Because if you think about the dates between 1345 to 1519 is a very short period of time, okay? They flourished rapidly in central Mexico, okay? From um, Aztec art and, art and ideology from remaining remnants, we know that they saw themselves as originating from a group of nomadic barbarians that migrated from what is today um, southern, basically the southern United States, a location that we don't really know exactly where it is now, but which um, was termed Atzlan, okay, um, which is a, a term that has been um, chosen and picked up by the Chicano movement, okay, which is a very de deliberate act, okay, so the Aztecs themselves originated from Atzlan according to themselves, and that's spelled A-Z-T-L-A-N, okay. This mythic homeland probably um, was somewhere in New Mexico, um, vaguely, according to um, Aztec history. And um, as nomadic barbarians, they made their way to central Mexico and founded their capital city on, on a lake, on Lake Texcoco, okay, um, T-E-X-C-O-C-O. -O. Now this is really significant because building an empire on a lake um, is, is very strategic and important and powerful. Why do you think? For um, protection. You okay. Know, can't approach you. Okay. For one, it's also really hard to do, so you look you look awesome. Yeah, that's important. And, and the Aztec were really good at looking awesome. <laughs> and have lots of potential for transportation. Okay, exactly. Water in the area. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it's a fertile region. So it, 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 end, it ends up being fertile for agriculture and enables the production of um, floating, what are called floating gardens or chinampas, so agriculture that was built on these canals. So floating gardens to grow things in a way in this, this water of Lake Texcoco, okay? So it enables in a way um, an, an ability for a, a great metropolis or urban center to flourish. And visitors, European visitors in 1519 often compared Tenochtitlan to Venice, okay? in its cosmopolitanism, its beauty, its canals and waterways, its incredible urban structures. And in this, in this center of, of the city lay the twin pyramid ceremonial complex of the Templo Mayor, which I'm showing you here, which is one of your main objects. This is the main temple of the Aztec Empire. Now, twin temples as a phenomenon flourished largely in the late post-classic as a building style and a building type. So many of the temples we would look at before this in Mesoamerica were single temples, not twin temples. This idea of the twin temple was something um, specific to the post-classic, and it also enabled the Aztecs to highlight their notions of um, their lineage and their dynasty based on dual concepts. And we're gonna be talking about this duality here. First off, I just wanted to bring in a, a um, an image to show you again the importance of this idea of the Axis Mundi. The Templo Mayor as the central ceremonial complex in the capital city was um, considered the Axis Mundi point to the empire. Now where would this Axis Mundi point hit in a building like this? It would hit right through the center of the Twin Pyramid complex. Okay? This idea of linking the celestial, the celestial, okay, the terrestrial and the underworld in one building one powerful propagandistic building. 
Now, this building um, today, okay, looks like this on the bottom right. Okay, this um, we only see, it's, it's built up in various layers like the skins of an onion, okay? If you, um, un, if you peel open the building, each ruler, each emperor built a new layer of the Temple of Mayor. So the last layer of the Temple of Mayor was the one built by Motakuzoma the second, okay? What we have today, we only have very few layers left of the building um, because the rest of it was destroyed when the Spaniards came in, okay? And a um, cathedral was built quite nearby because this idea, of course, was that the Spaniards were going to superimpose their own religious structures on top of Native American ones, which is a classic um, imperial tactic all throughout the world. Romans did this, you know, many, many civilizations did this. Okay, so here we actually have a scale model, so you can see in the top scale this idea of the peeling away of layers. Now, why would each emperor build a different layer of the Templo Mayor? Because in a way, it was again showing this idea of dynastic rulership, and between the layers of the building, the, the, there would be buried objects from throughout the, the empire. So it acted as a building that was like a giant cache cache of objects from all the different regions around Mesoamerica. So inside you could find things from Teotihuacan, you could find Olmec objects, you could find Maya, Maya objects. The, and these wouldn't simply be artistic objects, but sometimes they would be pure jade, they'd be feathers, you, there'd be sculptures, there'd be masks, okay. And it, it, it gets even more complicated because the building inside of it, okay, even though inside we have in a way layers of an onion that we can see here, um, the building was divided into two different sides. One side of the building was devoted to the god of rain named Tlaloc, and I, and I spelled his name right there, T-L-A-L-O-C, the god of rain. The other side of the pyramid was devoted to the god of war named Huitzilopochtli, mm -hmm. and his name is hard to pronounce. <laughs> Now, the idea here is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very important Mesoamerican concept of duality, okay? The idea of in one building, you have a building that encompasses both concepts of war and of fertility, regeneration and violence, built into one structure, okay? Most Mesoamerican deities have two genders or in a way are, are flexible to move back and forth. Buildings themselves have the concepts between, you know, dual aspects of nature. So this is, it's a very Mesoamerican idea here. But the building itself then was devoted as such so that the, ca the objects housed or, or, or deposited within the, the layers of the onion would be objects devoted to, on the side of Tlaloc, objects of fertility, and on the side of Huitzilopochtli, objects of war. Okay, so when archaeologists go into the Temple of Mayor to find things, they find things like jade objects on the side of Tlaloc, and they find things like swords, um, bloodletting objects connected to the side devoted to Huitzilopochtli. Okay, so it's an impressive structure, and okay, again, nobody lived there, right? This is, this is a symbolic building. Um, now, I, I wanted to bring back in where possible, this is where colonial sources can be useful. Um, this is a cave scene from a 16th century pictorial manuscript, okay, of, um, uh, of what's called um, a Chico Motztak, which, which is a, in the, in the Nahuatl language, a, a kind of sacred cave, and you don't even need to know that term, but the idea that I wanted to show you here is the idea that even ceremonial buildings and a ceremonial precinct was linked to the idea of a sacred cave, a kind of inner world portal that transports you into a kind of interior space. So there's this metaphor then that temples are like caves. They're like the axis mundi. There's this whole kind of relational concepts that build on each other. Yes? So each layer was a specimen of the building? No, closed off. Each layer was closed off, not accessible. Yeah, they okay. built the next layer. Yeah. Filled, with filled it. Yeah. Depository. Yeah. And if you ever get a chance to go to Mex Mexico City, I mean, visiting the Temple Mayor is it's an incredible experience because to see this in person and to see, um, you know, th all these sort of ideological concepts that the Aztecs had in, you know, in real time is, is amazing. It's an amazing thing. So here, yeah, I mean, we're just seeing the sort of the remnants of it in downtown Mexico City. So let's go back um, to the main Temple Mayor. 
Um, now, the Aztecs had a different artistic style than the Maya did. The Maya were interested in kind of a delicacy and a finesse of line, okay, of curve, of light, okay. Um, carving and painting were incredibly important. The Aztec, in general, were known for producing monumental sculpture in stone. Monumental being really monumental, massive. Massive stone sculpture because in a way it had the most impact on a viewing public. Objects that in a way shocked you and stirred you and moved you as a viewer. Okay, so for example, I'm gonna jump to this one. <clears throat> And I, shockingly, did not show a scale of this. So let me look in the book, too. Okay, the, one of the most important sculptures um, of the Aztec world that we have today is the Coil Shauki Stone, which translates to She of the Bells. Now, what was this as a sculpture? What is it depicting, and where was it placed? And I'm going to just see really quick if the book has a... It was used, I mean, again, it was used as a kind of theatrical space, and this sculpture is connected to that. It was used as a theatrical space where people, in a way, the community would, at certain important times of the year, congregate in front of it. In the theatrical, not yeah. on the structure. Not on the structure, but I'll show you. This, this object is connected to the structure itself. So here we have, um, and I don't, if any of you have internet, I don't know if any of you have um, internet access really, can get on it really quick. If you can pull up a, um, an image in sight of, of this stone, it might help us here, but I'll explain how it works. The Coil Shauki stone was <clears throat> located at the base, right here, if you can see it, of the bottom of the side of the temple devoted to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. It's a stone sculpture that basically is emblazoned with a story, okay, that tells a kind of um, ancestral founding myth of the city. Now, yeah, sure. Um, because I don't know this word, and when you say twin temples, I'm seeing the two tops, that's mm -hmm. a twin temple. Yeah, that's a twin temple. Um, are those stairs leading up? That's They're staircases. The it's a and then the stone appears to be very large at the baseline. Exactly. So that gives you some sense, that gives you some sense of the scale of the stone. So a massive stone, and again, this stone was painted, okay, so it's not, it doesn't look like the way it does, it was, was ornately painted, and it laid as a giant base at the staircase of the side of the temple devoted to Huitzilopochtli, <laughs> the god of war. Okay, so just in terms of its positionality, how are you viewing this, or how is the sculpture then used? I mean, think about as a sculptor producing this. This isn't a sculpture that sits up for a viewer to look at, right? It's, okay, okay. So how, how do you think it might be used? Did it receive the dismembered body right. yeah. of the sacrifice from it's like the right. table? Right. Okay, so it's a body that is showing us the depiction of a dismembered female body, first of all. And let's, in fact, I think it's, it's important, let's break it apart bit by bit, but let's look at it iconographically first. How do we know this is a dismembered body? And this, an Aztec sculpture is really fabulous and wonderful exactly because these relief sculptures, so it's, it's basically only carved on the top. Okay, it's not carved um, in, the, in the round, it's only carved on the top as a relief sculpture. And um, it has, in a way, this two-dimensionality, okay, but the sculptor, in a way, has produced a sense of an animation and a kind of running. So in a way, we see a dismembered female body, but she's animated, it's like she's in the act of running here. How do we see that? How do we see her movement? Okay, exactly. So we see her legs. It's like she's running like this. So it's, it's, it's really fabulous. She's running, but how do we know she's dismembered? 
Okay, we see her bones coming out, okay? We see um, her breasts, okay? Her breasts, in a way, are also an index of her age. She's supposed to be a woman who has given birth. And how do you think we can tell this? Besides the breasts, we have this kind of, the idea of kind of showing sagging breasts, but also the abdominal lines under the sculpture, the idea that a woman who has given birth, okay? And there are wonderful, wonderful things you can do with gender in Aztec sculpture because, oh yeah, that's great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Flat. It's flat. Yeah. It was flat. It is. It is. These are these. The sculptures are shocking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a dismembered female body, a woman that's given birth. Okay. We know that she has a headdress on. We can see her feathered headdress. We can see her skull belt, the belt with a skull attached to it. So we can break open the kind of iconography of the Aztec world through just looking at this too. I mean, there's just wonderful iconography. Okay, we see her, you know, protruding bones in this. Um, she is naked, and naked in sort of in Mesoamerican the Aztec world was a sign of subjugation or submission if you're not wearing clothing. So we have a female naked body that's dismembered. This is all significant. So here we have an, an image of subjugation. Who was Coyle Shauki? Okay. <laughs> Do you think? And does anybody know the story? Somebody, somebody, was it you is that it mentioned sister? it? Yeah. The sister we saw last okay. Time. So what, what's going, what, why? I, the way I heard it was she was the moon and he was the sun. Right. Okay. The, sto the story, the story, it, the story it's, it's a complex one from Aztec mythology, but essentially Coyle Shauki, in a way, Huitzilopochtli decides to kill Coyle Shauki. Okay? He does this by throwing her down a temple. The act of throwing her down a temple staircase dismembers her body. Producing a sculpture that in a way recreates a kind of heroic mythology of the Aztec Empire is significant here on the main ceremonial precinct. Because in a way, it inscribes on a building and in stone these idea of these origin myths and the idea of the Aztecs creating a mythology about themselves. Okay? So she's <coughs> thrown down the Huitzilopochtli side of the temple precinct and a human body that's thrown down a temple would become dismembered and bloodied in a way lay at the base like this. Okay. So it's again also aligning this idea of a kind of violence with a state ideology, which is oftentimes why the Aztec get classed or stereotyped as being an incredibly violent culture. But these are in a way propagandistic tactics. Okay. This is not about a kind of everyday life. We're talking about propaganda here, state propaganda. And this is an important thing to distinguish. Okay. This is a way of a kind of control and power. Does that, does that have anything to do with why they're so steep? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And it, the idea of building the most vertical structure you can. So a kind of verticality, it's like building a skyscraper. You don't want to build a skyscraper that's small. You want ultimate verticality, right, to, to, to do that. Okay, so um, she is, okay. So she's depicted in the round, she's depicted in movement, she's in relief, and we have the idea of a kind of subjugated women, woman inscribed on a, the main temple. Now, Aztec sculpture, and this is made of volcanic stone, to give, to also just to give some sense of the materiality, but um, the scale of this image is, is phenomenal. And it's not just the Coyol Shauki stone, but most sculpture that we have is, is produced on a kind of monumental level. We do have small portable sculptures from the Aztec world as well, but not from the imperial center. Okay, so the Aztecs were an empire, so there are a lot of peripheral regions of the empire that produced other kinds of art. Less monumental art because it wasn't used in the same way as it was in the capital city. So that's an important, also an important thing to, to recognize. So um, it looks 
similar in certain ways to the calendar stone. So before we get into what the calendar stone is, think about just a comparison between the aesthetics of the Coil Schauke stone and the calendar stone. How are they, what's similar about them in formal terms, visually? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I should actually, s I, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, a lot of, like, short, choppy, okay. shapes. Okay. Short, choppy, geometric shapes. Okay. There's this idea always of movement, this wonderful idea of this kind of um, fluidness. Yes. Well, think of her as moving, yeah, yeah she'd be, she's rolling, it's like a rock, it's like tumbling down, like rolling. There's, yeah, there's this idea of movement, which is incredible. And I should say, this sculpture was actually found in the 1970s when they were digging for the subway in Mexico City. Wow. So it's, yeah, so it's recent, it's a, it's a fairly recent archaeological discovery that they made. They hid it in, when, they were, when the city crews were building the subway system. Yeah. So it was not in proximity to the temple? It was actually dislocated. It wasn't right next to the thing. But, but you have to, one of the, the things that you have to think about with the fall of the Aztec Empire is when the Spaniards came in and they were ransacking things, things got, stones got reused. Um, Aztec temple stones were used to build the church that's across the street. Things, things were dislocated all over the place. So, and much of it was buried. Because the idea was you had to bury, the Spaniards wanted to bury sculpture as quickly as possible to get it out of sight so that the population wouldn't see it. Right, because it was too, you know, it had too much of an impact. It was too much of a retention of the culture, right? Okay, so um, the sunstone or the calendar stone, and it alternately has two different names here, was actually discovered in the 18th century. And it was placed in various locations. Actually, the life of this particular sculpture is fascinating in itself, because it was actually moved to the University of Mexico City, and it was used as a sculpture for the students to look at. It had various manifestations and various lives before it ended up in, in, in a museum. But it was also um, discovered in the 18th century, dislocated from its sites of origin. Okay, so we don't know exactly where it stood. So there's a wonderful book by Mary Ellen Miller, who's the author of this book here, that just came out a few years ago from the Getty, that is a, the book is only on the sunstone and the importance of this object. Because this is probably the most important object, one of the, the most important objects in the history of Mexico. Largely because it's become used today as a kind of symbol of nationalism. Now, is this a calendar? What is it? And here I wanted to show you again, this is the view of the sunstone in the Museum of Anthropology today that's basically in the recesses of, of, um, of the room, but it's highlighted, it has this kind of um, church-like lighting where all the illumination of the entire room um, hits this object. And this is um, an image just to show you the color reconstruction of what it probably looked like. All of these we have to think about as being highly colored again. Can they tell if it would have been displayed like that on the wall or more horizontal like the other one? You know, um, there, there are different debates around it, whether it was vertical or flat. And some scholars like to claim that like the Coil Schauke stone, it was flat, but probably it was used to be seen. But there are debates whether this is actually a sacrificial stone. So let, let's get into that. It might actually be a sacrificial stone. So um, this did not function as a calendar. But it worked as a record, a propagandistic record of calendrical cataclysm. And it represents the Aztec cosmic scheme of the world. So essentially what it is, is it's, it's, it's like a solar diadem. Okay? It's showing us, in a way, the kind of cosmic system of the Aztec world. And at the center of this, we have um, what's called the, the day sign. Okay, there, there are different day signs in the Aztec calendar. The day sign at the center of this is something called Olin, O-L-L-I-N, which also means movement. Did you say the day sign? Mm -hmm. D-A-Y? D-A-Y. There are different, every day is connected to a different sign in the Aztec calendar. 
And this is, again, where things get really, really, really complicated, and a way too complicated to get into for this, because that's, it's a whole universe to just understand um, concepts of time in the Aztec world and the Maya world. But suffice it to say, the center of this is the day sign called Olin, OK? O-L-L-I-N. And I can send you, I can actually can send you guys some recent articles just on the calendar stone. If we can set up, maybe we can set up a Dropbox folder. Because this, this, I think is, there's wonderful literature on it, so it, and it's very, very interesting. Okay, so let's look at the color reconstruction here. So essentially in the Aztec um, or Mesoamerican system of time, there are 20 day names, okay? And here what we're actually seeing is the idea of um, different day signs that are being emblazoned on this stone sculpture, framed by the center, the idea of movement. Say that again, please. Okay, we have 20 day signs. <laughs> And at the center, we have the, day, the, the sign of movement at the very center of it. And we can see this as this kind of this um, face, this monster mask with a, an obsidian blade tongue coming out. Obsidian blades were used for sacrifice. They were used to, to, to do auto-sacrifice for different parts of the body. So at the very center of the sculpture, we have the idea of sacrifice again. Sacrifice and movement? Yeah. And again, there's this Mesoamerican concept that bloodletting and sacrifice is what regenerates the universe and enables it to sort of move forward and to go on. This sunstone is considered a stone commemoration of the four previous eras of time, essentially, as, as, as a giant piece of iconographic work. Previous eras of time. Is that what the four? Yeah, and here we can see, okay, and here we can see the division, it's almost like again, like an axis mundi, we can see the division of this into four. One, two, three, four, okay? Which is, and I'm gonna jump to this and I'll come back to it, the same as the Codex Mendoza, which is a symbolic rendering on paper of the ceremonial precinct of Tenochtitlan. So like the Templo Mayor, this is, another this is another representation of the center of the universe. The symbol, the toponym for Tenochtitlan, which you see here, okay, is the symbol of the eagle on the nopal cact cactus, okay, which is where the Templo Mayor sits. And here we have the four watery causeways. Just like in this stone, we have this idea of the division of the, of the four, the kind of the four parts of the world, and this idea of the, the kind of the commemoration of previous eras of time. Okay, so what was this? Some scholars claim that this could have been used as another sacrificial stone like the Koyal Shauki stone. for bloodletting, perhaps bloodletting or sacrifice took place on top of it as a way of symbolically, in a way, ensuring the continuation of time itself, okay? There are some scholars claim that that's not the case, but we, we don't exactly know. That's one, of the, that's one of the debates around this. But it does look strikingly simber, similar to this, okay, to the Koyal Shauki. Now, we can jump to this and we can jump back to the, to the sunstone, but the Codex Mendoza here um, is interesting precisely because it's a different kind of pictorial representation of the same idea. So one could actually do a visual comparison between the Codex Mendoza frontispiece and the Templo Mayor. You could do, one could do a visual comparison, really, between the Templo Mayor, this main ceremonial precinct, and the Codex Mendoza. 
So, okay, so what are we looking at? Here we have um, a representation on paper, okay, of, in a way, the idea of the four causeways that come together with the ceremonial precinct in the center. This representation of the eagle on the cactus, okay, is the toponym, so it's the symbol for a place, it's the symbol for Tenochtitlan. So every city-state, every place, every location in the Aztec world had a toponym. It had a picture that represented a place as a kind of pictorial language, okay? This was um, the, the toponym for the capital city, and where have, where have you seen this image before? Okay, this is the Mexican flag. Okay, so this is the symbol that's emblazoned on the Mexican flag today. To show you how, you know, Aztec political ideology has been used by the modern nation state too, right? As a, you know, as importance. So here we have the division of the world, and we have the division of the world by different, in a way, different important families, genealogies. So the, the, the four quadrants here that are being marked out in the Codex Mendoza are different dynasties that come together to make up the empire. Because every distant region of the empire is ruled by different people, right? So in a way, it's showing us, in a way, that coming together of the world in one picture. And you can see each, you know, each figure, okay, has a name. You can see on their, on their cloak, on their tilmatli, which is the cloak, the Aztec name for a cloak. And um, they have different symbols associated with them as well, okay? Now, the Codex Mendoza was a large um, a book. A codex is largely a book. I mean, this is, this is a, a period term in the 16th century to describe a book. And inside of it were various kinds of pictures that showed us, in a way, or show scholars today, important things about the Aztec world. This was produced by a, largely by, um, Aztec artists under the tutelage of European friars. So the Europeans are wanting to map out what right. the Aztecs are. And exactly. Aztec artists and right. they're trying to make sense of them. Right, absolutely. So it wasn't necessarily Aztecs trying to, now that they've been subjugated, preserve their history. It was more Europeans wanting to Well, you're, you're, like a handbook. You're, 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 well, yeah, but you're, you're bringing up an incredibly important point because it's very slippery. Aztec artists are most assuredly trying to map out their universe. But also European artists are instructing them to, to, to depict certain things. So who has the agency, right? But certainly Aztec artists are deciding and making choices, artistic choices themselves, and representing their world the way they want to represent it, right? So there's a lot of power. There's a kind of power dynamic involved in this, but it's not one-dimensional. So here we have tribute lists. So this is inside the Codex Mendoza. This is the frontispiece. So this is the image that's most commonly found and that you'll see depicted. But when you get inside of it, you see things like tribute lists. Okay, so what do you think that we're seeing? What can we make out here? <laughs> right. This is great. We see Quetzal feathers. We see birds. We see jaguar pelts. Okay. Bundles of cloth, which were also used as tribute items. Okay. Mm-hmm. But we have also different things. I mean, these are different toponyms for different locations. So you see Metztitlan, which was a region in central Mexico. So certain things came from certain places. So this is the idea of mapping out where things came from, OK, as well. Bolts of cloth at the top, different textiles. And those, in fact, actually, the uniforms are basically, um, you know, deity, um, deity garb that would be worn on feast days. Yes? It's in Nahuatl and in Spanish, both. in both. Which is a lot, many of the pictorial manuscripts from the 16th century work in both languages. So who are the tributes coming in? I mean, is it historical or is this tribute still coming in? They're still coming, they're still coming in. I mean, what's the interesting thing is that in the 16th century when the Spaniards come in, they basically take over, but the same structures are in place. They have to, in a way. So this would be contemporary. So yeah. It's um, probably a serpent headdress, like an like a indication of a, of a serpent. Okay. Yeah. 
These are, it's an indication of cochineal. What's cochineal? The color red. So the insects that were used to produce the color red that were so important. So it was also an important tribute item and it became important for the Spanish who began exporting it to different European countries in the 16th century. So they overtook the tribute, took advantage of it, and expanded it to Europe. So these are, it's, it's a great, so it's a whole economic world that we get to see here of the Aztecs through these pictorial manuscripts that are completely bicultural. Again, the, and then on the top we see jade beads. I mean, you can see a turtle at the top. Under, underneath it looks like a coyote. I'm not even sure. We have different things. Um, it looks like, on the top there, it looks like a frog in the water. I'm not quite sure what it is. But in a way, you can study the Codex Mentosa to understand the intricacies of the kind of the economic universe of the 16th century. Yeah. Oh, wow. A very fine collection um, of similes uh, of Native American prices. So you can go and see this in fact similes. Fabulous. In yeah. yeah. It's a great collection. Yeah. So. That's great. Cool. Yeah. And they're just inc they're incredible. These books are just treasure troves. And very few of them exist from the 16th century because one of the things the Spaniards did was they decided to burn books as soon as they came in. So we have very few, in a way, remnants of, of this world. No, when they came into Mexico City. Yeah. 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 OK, so here, in a way, this is connected to this is connected to the tribute list. So I wanted to jump off to show you Motokozuma's headdress to show you, in a way, the preciousness of this object, of course, was connected to ideas of commodity trade within the Aztec Empire. Now, this actually wasn't a headdress. It's called Motekozuma's headdress. It wasn't a headdress. We know that it was probably used in processions, in ceremonial processions, and actually held on a stick and processed through the city streets. Okay. Um, it was made, there's been, a, this actually is housed today in the, in the um, Ethnographic Museum of Vienna. It was given as a gift to Charles V of Spain, okay, and then wound its way to Austria because he was part of the Habsburg Empire, okay. <laughs> and so since the 16th century, this has been in Vienna, sadly, okay. Um, has there been repatriation attempts? Um, have, they've never been successful because this is a really precious object. And there recently was actually another attempt to just get this. I mean, I work on feathers, it's my specialty. And there was an attempt to get this piece for a major exhibition on feather work in Mexico City. And the institutions of Mexico were not able to get it. So. Yeah, because they were afraid that they might stay. Right. 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 Yeah. How common is the Quetzal bird? They're obviously harvesting the feathers, not killing them, but is there? The th well, the thing is, I mean, the thing about, about feather work and harvesting feathers is you don't kill a bird when you pluck its feathers for feather working. So there's an intricate system of harvesting feathers. So you only pluck, for a Quetzal feather, you'd pluck one feather, tail feather, for example, so that the bird could live and it could produce more. So the idea is it takes an incredible amount of time and labor to go around to trade networks to obtain the amount of Quetzal feathers you need to produce something like this. And I, they did a calculation. It was over 100 birds or something like that that were used to produce this. So they yeah. Domesticated? yeah. Well, they, well, they're different kinds. Some birds were domesticated and some were just trapped. Uh -huh. Their feathers would be plucked and then they'd be let loose. But and they're different. But it's necessarily rare and that's why it's valuable because of the color or the book. It's because of everything. It's because the birds are hard to find and that largely Quetzal birds were from the Yucatan. So this is central Mexico. We're talking about the Aztec Empire is, is central Mexico now. We're in the arid highlands. We're not in an area where Quetzal birds are. So they, in a way, it, it, it demanded extensive trade networks, which was a show of tribute and power. And it was an examination of, of really the color and the preciousness. So here, and we also see, that with the design of this, we're using, at this point, we're using um, precious metals. So it's a colonial object. We know that. OK, because remember, we talked about metallurgy. And we're using, in a way, um, different bird feathers um, here, the Cotinga. So we have Quetzal and Cotinga feathers and gold that are used in one object. Now the Aztec produced different kinds of um, 
feather work before the conquest, and we know the Maya did extensive feather working as well. We have almost none of it that survives. But here I'm just showing you, um, out of curiosity, just so you have some context, these are other Aztec objects of feather work. These are shields. They're ceremonial war shields. So not used really in war, but used in the kind of performativity and theatricality of staging war and processions. Okay? And um, with these you know, beautiful abstract designs, and here we can see the one on the bottom with a, with a coyote. And the, the two ones, um, the two shields on the top are actually housed today in Germany in Stuttgart. So again, objects that are not in Mexico. And they're made out of feathers? Yeah. Here they're intricate mosaic feathers. So they're feathers that are chopped and then placed like a mosaic, almost like you'd produce stained glass, onto a base of leather. Dye or natural color? Both. Largely, the Aztec didn't dye feathers, they used natural colors. So feather working was really one of the most important pre-Columbian artistic practices throughout the Americas. Yeah, this is going to be another point of American connection to the going on with the British Museum. And we can now maybe broaden that argument. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's also feather work in the home in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. Ideas of harvesting feathers and right. things like that. So. Right. That whole allocation of food is such if it was it was incorporated in an episode of a TV show Sunday night. Um, <laughs> about the Secretary of State and Greece was trying to negotiate some sort of debt relief and somebody was holding their statues hostage. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Okay, so um, here I'm just showing you what a Quetzal bird looks like to show you the tail feathers. So you get some sense of, okay, what, we have three or four here? So yeah. four. Wow. Right, you can't exactly. So, and there was, a, there was a real interest in preserving the life cycle of birds and having an appreciation and understanding of how birds lived, okay, so that, that, that they... Because they are land and sky. Yeah, absolutely. And they, yeah, exactly, they, they in a way, they are migratory. They in a way traverse the realms of the universe that the human can't necessarily, right? Okay, and w what do we know about that? We have different colonial sources for understanding feather working practices, and I just brought this in to show you an image from the Florentine Codex, another 16th century book that's written in um, both, you can see the Spanish on the left, libro, and then you can see the, um, um, the Nahuatl um, um, on the right, and here we can actually see the practice of producing art made of feathers. So, these books, these 16th century books, are really important for us for understanding craft practice. So it's really through entering into some of these 16th century European sources that Aztec artists produced that we can understand something about the craft of feather working, for example, and also the craft of jade and jade collecting and jade carving. Okay. Now, did they collect jade that was other shades besides green? Yeah, they had a whole range of, of colors. But green was the most prized? Yes. And here. And give the Jesuits a little bit of credit. <laughs> oh, these are the Franciscans. <laughs> yeah. That makes more sense. More sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's another, just another example um, from a codex that gives us some sense of the way garments were used and worn, and so on and so forth. And I realized that I skipped over when you said jade. I skipped over the. Yeah. Um, that can't be number 166. Is it? Because it, it was found at the Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, now, what I was confused about this, and I didn't know because I, didn't, I couldn't understand it from the list, whether I'm assuming this is the, an Olmec object that was found in the Temple of Mayor, and it's not. It? Yeah. yeah, this is Olmec right. style. Right, right. Okay. Right, exactly. So, Many, many Olmec objects have been found in the Tlaloc side of the Temple Mayor. So here we have um, a jadeite mask. And I actually, did you have the dimensions on the mask? No. They don't give any. Okay. I'll, I'll again put that on the list. I'll find it because this is actually important. Um, a lot of Olmec masks are in American collections, actually. The Dallas Museum of Art has quite a few. I, I've seen them at LACMA. Um, 
and they've been found in caches throughout, throughout Mesoamerican archaeological sites. But here, this is showing us, um, it, it, again, an Olmec-style mask. The Olmec was, were considered the mother civilization of Mesoamerica, a culture we know very little about, a culture that is largely talked about in terms of shamanism and this idea of kind of ritual transformations of deities from um, deity forms into jaguars and back again. It's, it's a culture that in a way deserves much more scholarship because there's very little that's known outside of the kind of iconography people have been able to pull from things like these sculptures, okay? Um, many of the faces of these masks, like the sculptures, have this kind of particular look that scholars have sometimes claimed that is it, it could be an indication that there was spina bifida in the community. This is one of the kind of arguments. Um, but largely, nobody knows. There, there hasn't been um, enough research or evidence to be able to, to reveal whether it's a stylistic choice or a representation of the community, right? Um, I would tend to think it's a stylistic choice, but it's something that, you know, we scholars have, have argued out. But this, this, in, this idea of the, of the kind of the shape of the face, the lips, the eyes. Um, so, again, people have used it as an indication possibly of kind of inbreeding within dynasties that took place in the, in, you know, within the dynastic structure of the Olmec. But here, this is significant because by choosing to take an Olmec object and put it in the Temple of Mayor, what kind of choice is that? Establishing a connection. Okay, it's establishing a connection to the, what was considered the mother culture, the originary culture of Mesoamerica. So again, it's a kind of power over a kind of geographic domain. Masks were extremely important um, in all Mesoamerican cultures, this idea of putting on a kind of personification of another being. Okay, so that could be, that took, take the place of a kind of, of, of a kind of, of a deity mask, or it could take the place of insignia and clothing, where you're basically taking on the skin of another. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Was, was the deity perhaps for hair or strands of something? Um, a lot of the Olmec masks have that kind of stylistic choice of a V, um, and it's, it's thought that those are used as a way, that the holes are used as a way of holding on a mask onto a figure. A lot of these masks weren't for people to wear, but they were for images to wear. So even images wore masks. So if you think about that in art historical terms, it's really interesting, the idea that a representation wears another representation. This idea of your, you layer skins of identity onto something. Right? Been part of belts. Yeah, and there, yeah, and there are masks that are part of belts. Just like we see the, we, we've seen different deities that have a skull mask or a monster mask. Masks were used um, in different parts of the body. They were used as elbow shields around the waist. So there was a great variety of which you sort of place different identities on your personhood. And again, made of a precious material, which would have automatically associated it with Tlaloc, the fertility deity. <coughs> okay. And here, again, just showing you this, another image from the Florentine Codex to show um, the placing of feathers on a piece of cotton to produce an image. And there they're actually mixing a different, a kind of cactus where they'd produce a glue that they used to paste on the feather. So these, these images are really fabulous. Okay, let's move to the Andes. Okay. Um, again, we have a, a completely different um, geographic space here. We can see that um, Largely, the cultures that we're going to be talking about, which are um, the Chavin and the Inca. Do we have any other? It's Chavin and Inca, correct? Yeah. OK. We don't, I think. What about the silver and gold maize columns? Inca. That's Yeah. And then Cusco? Inca. And then Machu Picchu? Inca. OK. It's funny, that I don't know, the choices that are used in this are actually really 
I, yeah, that when I received the list, I was really actually disturbed, and I was wondering what colleagues of mine are actually choosing these <laughs> selection of objects. <laughs> Right. 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 An explanation I heard about just the cost of obtaining copyright and just forced them to take. Oh, really? From secondary and tertiary really? collections that were just that people that are from most cultures or from every yeah. culture are looking at this and saying, it's not right. representative. Right. Right. It doesn't seem broad enough to me. Is that I mean it should be broader. Right. Well, they got some work to do. There is a chugging de Quantas. Yeah. I mean and if you take all of Latin America, right. I mean, it's just it's it's still heavy. so yeah. many from Central Mexico right. and then a handful from the Inca region and then nowhere else. Right. It's just sort of It's crazy, yeah. Right. Right. Um and the other thing that yes. disturbs me about this, mm -hmm. just frankly, mm -hmm. now that we're on it, because mm -hmm. I suggest you take it, is that when you look at the weight on free contact, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then some colonial, but modern. No, I know there are two modern. objects. There's a Frida Kahlo and a, a, I know. Right? And Absolutely. Then, what is it saying about modern right. art and modern right. culture? Which is interesting because it's usually. The reverse in academia, at least within Latin American art, is that modernism is always weighted against history. So it's, it's fascinating that this is doing the reverse. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So um, we move to the Andes, which is the, the other um, major cultural region in Latin America that's predominantly studied in terms of the ancient Americas. And our examination of Andean art is again beginning, um, like with Mesoamerica, with the idea of the earliest cultures. So Chavin being an example, like the Olmec, of one of the originary cultures of the Andean world. Okay. And a culture that produced art and architectural style that was adopted by various regions in the area in subsequent time periods. So the idea that there becomes a kind of idea of a pan-Andean style. So we have to understand, in a way, looking at Chavin art as something that forms a kind of base style that gets brought through time, gets traced. So how do we, in a way, reconstruct or understand Andean art? We, we have to do the same thing that we've done in Mesoamerica, where we rely on both archaeology and we rely on a comparison with art from later cultures, like the Inca, to understand art going back in time. And here, I just wanted to show us um, a map of, the, of, of where we'll be talking about. Here is Chavin, okay? So we can see the um, Andean range, uh, the giant mountain range that basically um, encrusts the western portion of South America here. And we can see that, um, that Chavin is located here, okay? And um, the cultures of Cusco um, and the Inca world and Machu Picchu are right here, okay, so that, to the south. And we can see that this becomes a kind of um, porous border region today between um, Bolivia and Peru, okay. Now, located in the northern area of Peru and the highlands, we have intermountain valleys. So we're, we're talking about regions that are highly mountainous with an extreme difference between wet and dry seasons. And for the site of Chavin, no, jump here, I actually show you time period divisions here. The impressive site of Chavin um, that we're gonna be talking about um, lies at 10,333 feet of altitude in the easternmost snowy range of the Cordillera Blanca Mountains. So let's actually go back to the map. So if we look at where Chavin is, we look that it's situated between, in a way, a, a kind of, we can't see the mountain range in this, but we can see the kind of outline of river valleys as well, is the, the idea of a kind of strategic location. Its locale is highly unusual for its access to arts. Okay, we know that architecture flourished 
okay, in this particular region, and we know that it was a pilgrimage center, an important location of luxury goods from afar. So it became a kind of centrifugal place in a little bit the way that Tenochtitlan did, a kind of location where everything, everything happened there. And it was a disseminator of what we can call an Indian, Indian style. The expansion and changes of over 700 years of Chavin illustrate the long-term success of its cults. And we'll talk about the idea of what a cult is and its aesthetics or its, its artistic style. So time period. Oops. Okay. We're looking at, in a way, um, the architectural complex we're looking at with Chavin in the Northern Highlands flourished between 900 and 200 BCE. And we're looking at stone and a stone architectural complex. We're looking at a giant stone or a, a granite sculpture called the Lanzon that we're going to be looking at. And we're looking at hammered gold alloy jewelry. Mm -hmm. At 10,000 feet or mm -hmm. something like that, how did it become the center? The center. Like how, uh, that just seems like so high. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> the Andean world is impressive in the sense that, you know, all of these major capital cities are in incredibly high locations that became, um, they became imperial centers. There were trade networks, there were routes of transportation that were developed um, across mountain ranges, across long distances. And in a way, it was about utilizing a different kind of geography in a way that is radically different than Mesoamerica. The idea of building on peaks and building in mountain ranges. And according to you know, the article that we read by Carolyn Dean, what's so significant about building in mountains? Well, the, the Indian world was interested in rocks and the idea of mimicking architectural complexes that mimicked the kind of natural world around them. Okay, so the idea is if you were going to build an architectural complex here in Salt Lake City, you'd build it at the base of this mountain range so that you could replicate, in a way, the mountain range that sits behind it. So this idea of the kind of replication of the natural world and the idea of sites that are safe and inaccessible from enemies as well. Okay, so Chavin is located at the meeting of two rivers. We know it was the ceremonial center at the meeting of true tri tributaries, the, the, the river Marañón, which flows into the Amazon, and the Rio Mosna and Huachesca, okay? And it was named after the small village which is close to the site. It was composed of both a residential compound and a ceremonial center. We know that it functioned as a religious center, a pilgrimage site, or what's called an oracular site. What do you think oracular site means? Oracles. Yeah. Okay, what are oracles? Um, signs from the heavens. Okay. Okay, prophecies, signs. In a way, this idea, a place where you, where you hear and can commune with the gods. It was originally believed that Chavin was ideally situated for trade in between the 10 passes that led to the Amazon. So this idea that it was a kind of nexus point for different locations. This theory today um, has been debunked and scholars today don't think it was such a strategic commercial center, um, which makes them think that there was probably much more of a religious function or something sacred to the site itself that that was the reason it flourished. So that's been something that in the scholarship has been changing. The area was not good for agriculture. <laughs> and all of the typical things that are used to determine site settlement don't apply to Chavin. Yeah. Right, <laughs> okay. Um, so why build a site here? The kind of logical explanation is that it must have had a kind of sacred dimension to it that led it to have this kind of power. In Andean cosmology, a place where two rivers meet is considered to be a highly charged sacred space. And in Quechua, it's called a, a, a tinkui. A t, it's called, you spell this in Quechua, it's spelled T-I-N-K-U-Y, a highly charged sacred space. And this is, again, the deployment of a kind of Native American word would be in Carolyn Dean's terms, an attempt to try to enter in through the culture here. And 
we'll see this concept return when we look at the capital city of the Inca, too. So this idea of building a highly charged sacred site. And for the Inca, the same Quechua term denoted balance and harmony. The same Quechua term, tink, tinkui, yeah. T-I-N-K-U-Y. What does it mean It means a highly charged sacred space, and it also means balance and harmony. <coughs> okay, so here we're looking at um, the main ceremonial complex. We see the new temple and the old temple in a, this is a reconstruction, so an image of a reconstruction. We know that the monumental building of this temple site happened in five major phases. There were 51 renovations. And, to, and this building actually in its totality, so the entire ceremonial complex is often called El Castillo in Spanish. Which is what? Anybody know Castillo? Castle. Castle, exactly. Okay. It was pressed up against the valley wall. It faces east. It consists of superimposed rectangular platforms. From the exterior, it seems like a solid mass, but really it's completely studded with maze-like passages at different levels with stairs connecting. It started as a single mound and grew into a U-shaped platform with, circular, with a circular sunken plaza in the front. Inside, okay, the ceremonial complex, galleries are narrow, they lead to larger rooms. The ceilings are constructed with amputated corbel arches, okay, and it's a very, very tight space where few people can enter at once. We know the walls were originally painted red and yellow with sculpted heads, and there was relief sculpture both on the interior and the exterior. Now, I wanted to actually read a passage from this book about the site, just because I thought it was actually so fascinating. Um, this is from the Art of the Andes book here. Um, and the, the author of this is a, is a specialist. And she talks about Chav Chavin art and architecture, and this gives us something to think about. Chavin is a very complex, baroque, and esoteric style, intentionally difficult to decipher intended to disorient and ultimately to transport the viewer into an alternate reality. Much of the cult's enormous success may be ascribed to the intense visual messages sent by buildings, their decoration, and the portable ritual objects within. Their strong perceptual effect, certainly calculated by Chavin artists, inspires confusion, surprise, fear, and awe through the use of dynamic, shifting images that contain various readings depending on the direction in which they are approached. So in a way, the direction of the viewer's approach, in a way, shifts the meaning. The term halluc hallucinatory or transformational aptly described much Chavin's subject matter and artistic effect. An important component of the style has been termed by George Kubler as, quote, visual metaphoric substitution, denoting that certain parts, especially hair, fur, cords, or whiskers are visually replaced by analogous elements like snakes. Both a great deal of visual complexity and deeply symbolic religious, religious concepts revolt from the Chavin solutions to the aesthetic problem of portraying two states at once, two states of the mind. The iconography features staff-bearing deities, predatory animals, human-animal composites, and shamans in the act of transformation. So just to give some sense of what we're talking about here um, and how radically different this is as a worldview than what we've been talking about in Tenochtitlan, for example, to give some, some sense of that. Okay, yes? Yeah, I'm trying to think what the, de what the proper definition of an Acropolis is, but... Yeah. Probably yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so here we're looking at the um, ceremonial complex. Um, we know that 
the architects of Chavin manipulated the streaming of light on the walls and directed them to interior passages through the use of mirrors. And one thing that's actually really fascinating about Andean aesthetics in general and distinctively different than Mesoamerica is the use of reflection and mirrors. Mirrors are actually used widely in the Inca world, okay? And um, 16th century churches in Cusco, many of the altarpieces are made completely of mirrors, which may have been a holdover from the Inca world, for example, into the colonial world. This use of the idea of reflection and luminosity and in a way, probably the doubling of image and, and all the kind of implications of what it means to use a mirror. So it, that, te that seems to be a kind of in, an Indian interest, the idea of reflection and the kind of mirror image of something. Okay. Um, there have been no evidence inside the ceremonial plaza that there were torches or um, candles that were used at all for lighting. We know that there were opulent water channels throughout the ceremonial complex, which would produce a gurgling, roaring noise. So that the idea that there was this kind of sonorous interest, the idea of producing, again, an experiential effect through sound. All, all, okay. Using natural light sources with mirrors. Oh, mirrors. Yeah, yeah. All of this was intended to have an experiential effect, okay? And um, disillusioning, this kind of, or disillusioning, disorienting, I guess is the proper word. One of the um, ob most important objects from this site is this particular um, sculpture called the Lanzon. It's granite, and it measures, four, I, think it, I think it's 14 feet and some, I believe the dimensions of it. It faces east toward the front of the complex. And essentially, lanzon means lance or knife. Is the pavement with the recessed parts, is that part of the original? Um, I believe it is, yes. Yes. Four recessed panels, is that what you're I believe it is. I believe it is, but I will check. I will check that to make sure. So we have an image that's as far as the lens on steel, it does something different because it looks like it's inside. Let me see the one. Oops. Yes, this is a different one. This is a different one. Yeah. 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 Okay, I just pulled the, let's, let, yeah, this one, <laughs> we can actually see this one, but. So is, is that a lens on too? This is a lens on too, but it's a sculpture and not the stela. So let's, I don't, I didn't bring in a picture of the stela, but um, we can, t I mean, we can talk about ex exactly what it is, for example, and how it flourished. So it's embedded in the one that you're looking at, it's embedded in the floor and the ceiling, correct? Yep. And the temple was, as far as I know, built around the Lanzon image. So the idea is that the whole temple complex was built around this as an oracular sculpture, a shrine that encapsulates it. And it, it functions in a certain way. I'm going to use the same term. It functions as an axis mundi, OK, to join various levels of the cosmos. In a certain way, just like we can think of with the Temple of Mayor, or we can think of even in the Maya world, like um, particular kinds of trees called seba trees are also axis mundi points as well, even in the contemporary world today. Now, this is going to be another connection yeah. for us with um, things like the secret sun trees. Right? Mm -hmm. those, those works also have axis mundi connections to the universe. Yeah. Um, this is a, a vertical, I wish I could see it. It's a vertical image, this idea of a kind of verticality here. And there's a braided motif from top to bottom, visually emphasizing the connection between the realms. Okay. And it's thought that this is considered a, an image of a smiling god. And we can see that here with this. <laughs> Not the right image, but in a way, it's a different manifestation of the same iconography, the same oracle, oracular figure here. 
And it's the idea of an animal-human composite, a supernatural being. So again, we have a sculpture of a supernatural being. And in this way, it's reminiscent of a lot of Olmec art, okay, which is the ordinary culture of Mesoamerica, where a lot of these figures and masks are of supernatural beings as well. With the mouth, we have a thick band with a curled up, snarling look. We can see that with the, with the kind of mouth with the fang that's coming out. Okay? The idea of a kind of feline nose, eyes that are pendant with round pupils at top, ears with pendant ear spools. And they can, I'm hoping it's the same with this one there, but here we see the ear spools, okay, the fang. Um, the, the idea of this kind of aggressive supernatural force. The eyebrow and hair are snakes, the kind of swirling snake motifs. The top projection and skirt, we have the idea, there's a, the idea of split faces. Um, I'm, actually, I'd love to see if we can see it with this one. You can't see anything. <laughs> I will get a, I'll get a line drawing. I'll get a line drawing of that for you. Add it, you can add it to the list. It's on the list. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, good. So that we can see, in a way, the split faces. Now, the small room that was constructed above this, okay, inside the ceremonial precinct, would have fit a person. A person could fit inside and talk to the statue. The statue probably had an oracular function, and there's evidence of similar objects fun functioning like this in the Inca world in the 16th century. So again, this idea that we have a kind of pan-Andean religiosity that we can, can begin to trace here. Again, one of the, the ways that we can use terms like this, like Andean, because we have cultural concepts that endure over time and space. The art object was an object of veneration, and it's different from what we've seen thus far in that it, it represents the being of veneration. It's an object that is the being of veneration. And we also know that it was a channel for libations. So it's a place where you um, would have imbibed sacred ritual drinks, okay, which would have had the effect of enabling you to speak to the oracle more easily. If you, were in, if you were in the act of hallucination. Okay. I can't let this one okay. <laughs> I'm reading about this. The television show Ghost Hunters International recently made a trip to Chardin in the land zone and recorded odd heartbeat like sounds coming from the stone and other experiences that could not be explained. Uh, <laughs> the Oracle said it. <laughs> exactly. The Oracle said it. So in a way, there's a channel for libations, libations being burbling water or sacred drinks that begin in the room above and end in a recession that's shaped like an axis mundi portal as well. So there's this idea of this being a whole portal world to another dimension. So are we talking about the one we're looking at or that one or both? No, we're talking, the, I'm actually talking about the one that's in the room that you have, but I have an image of one that's outside. But it would be in a similar yeah. process. Yes. Yes. So it's like a stream? Yes. Like coming from up down yes. and then you would drink from it? Yes. And you would be in a niche above the sculpture. And in a way, this, you have to think about this as kind of a restricted access. So we're not talking about a sculpture where there's a huge public around it. We're talking about a sculpture that you interact with individually. Are there any Rum Dot Priestesses people? It, it, well, it's thought that important people would be able to speak to the oracle. I doubt that the common person would have had access to speak to the Lenzo. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we're talking again stratified societies, all of these objects in a way, the interaction with them would have been for a privileged few, no doubt. I, I'm just finally connecting it to the yeah. <laughs> and the priestesses and the liquids and the hallucinations. And yeah. So the old temple was intentionally constructed with a kind of desired experience as an end goal here. People in control of the old temple were in control of the visitor's sensory experience through the manipulation of sound and vision itself. There's other evidence of, of Chavin to suggest that these experiences would have been additionally aided by the use of hallucinogenic drugs, which were probably taken ritually at important events. Ah, here we go. I thought I did. Yeah. 
I did have one. <laughs> I do. Great, okay, I do. Okay, and what I can actually do is I can actually put together a PowerPoint of supplemental images to put on Dropbox too so that you can use them in, in teaching if you, if you need them. So yeah, here, here we have the image on the right. Sorry, were the, were the catch-all words for these tasks, are they known instead of the custody or not so on? Are the catch-all words for these structures known? They're known only through the kind of what backstreaming that we can do through Inca sources. Mm -hmm. So people largely use Inca sources and, and, and language to talk about the past here. So in a way, you have to think about the kind of filtering that takes place in the process. Okay, so here um, we can actually see where the Lanzon, Lanzon would have been located on the upper right uh, um, within the kind of ceremonial complex. Yeah. What's the circle that we see in there? Oh, and this is, this is, this is the one's good because we get the frontal piece. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Which one? Well, just that circle that says plaza that's... The sunken plaza? Uh -huh. The center of the ceremonial precinct in terms of a lowered space, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. This is about 14. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We can see the fangs yeah, much better. Yeah. And the line drawings. Yeah. Again, the axis mundi. There's another Chinese uh, sculpture that looks just like that. But there, I mean, it's, it's flat. It's, it's I think that there are many yeah. reiterations yeah. of the Lanzon. It looks like it. Yeah, it's so it becomes. Yeah, so it becomes, a, it becomes an, an image that gets reiterated in different sites. And here I just brought in, and this is a colonial 16th century image from the Inca world by Waman Poma, who is um, in a way showing, um, what, do you think is, what do you think is being depicted here? Okay. <laughs> well, what does it look like? Okay, it's said to be a kind of representation of the Lanzon, the idea of, the, of what we're seeing here in, in this colonial manuscript of a kind of personification of, of the Lanzon. Yeah, of the, or, the, the oracle itself. Oh, okay. If you go back to just the big picture, when you said once again the Axis Mundi, mm -hmm. are you talking about the... The sculpture itself. Okay. As a kind of oracle and as a, as a, st as a steel, you know, as a stone sculpture. Okay, and this, this actually, I put that in for context here. Okay, we actually don't have very much time. Um, I wanted to, to show these images of hammered gold alloy jewelry largely to just show the um, importance, especially in the Andean world, of metallurgy and of gold works. And just the ornate and intricate and beautiful gold jewelry that was largely used to you know, ornate important people's bodies and you know, nose rings and necklaces. And the idea of um, metal and gold and the luminousness of yellow as a color was extraordinarily important in Andean cultures. And this is something that we find, whether it's in textile design, um, in early cultures or in the Inca, or again with the idea of the luminosity of a kind of gold surface that is like a mirror too. And we'll look at, we'll look at this with the, Inca, with the Inca world and the building of the ceremonial temple, but this idea of gold as having in a way, um, being connected to rays of the sunshine, being connected to semen, being connected to vitality and fertility. So there are whole again associations connected to color in the pre-Columbian world, specific to the Andean region that are significant here. But gold was truly important in a way that it wasn't in Mesoamerica. Okay. Um, here, again, we have no, nose ornament, nose jewelry. And I brought in two examples of um, hammered gold ally jewelry um, from Chavin that I found off of two sites from the Cleveland Museum of Art. I wasn't sure what examples you were given. It was the nose ornament. Oh, guys, okay. Just to show the kind of variations in a way of, of the importance of, of ornament and the working, the fine crafting and artistry of gold jewelry as a way to emblazon the body with a kind of sun and light, a kind of shield that, that connects you to the deities in a way. And this has a wonderful face mask here, this necklace on the right. 
in a way these aren't complicated or intricate in the way that other ritual kinds of objects are. They don't go into the maze down here, do they? No, no, no. And these are, these are Chavin, these are Chavin images, so we have the idea of these kind of supernatural beings which are part of the iconography of Chavin. We can see maize issues of, of corn and other um, agricultural deities, are, we'll see that more in the Inca world. Do and we later. see um, any burial sites that have these sorts of objects in them? Yes, okay. yeah, lots of it, yeah. I wanna quickly move, since we only have 15 minutes, to the Inca world so that we can, we can get through the rest of this. Um, here I'm showing you, in a way, the central ceremonial precinct of the Cori Cancha, okay, um, which is, like the Templo Mayor, the central ceremonial precinct of the Inca Empire. And the Inca, again, were established at the, at the very um, contemporaneous with the Aztec at the end of um, the pre-Columbian period, in the beginning of the 16th century, before Pizarro came in. And here we have the remnants of the wall of the central building where the Spaniards adopted their main religious, you know, Catholic church on top of when they came in. Now, today we have the main temple and the church superimposed on each other, which is distinctly different than we have in Mexico City. Okay, here we have this. And we have to imagine a great de deal about what the Coricancha looked like. Um, these walls are built of intricate stonework. Now, we learned through the Carolyn Dean reading the importance of stone, okay? These stone walls were constructed without any mortar between them, okay? So Inca masons were so adept and so skillful in architecture and building with stone that they created seamless niches and in building patterns between stones that you couldn't even get a needle between them, okay? And this was all done through natural um, carving. So here we can see the sort of remnants of the wall of, of the Coricancha. Um, and the, in Quechua, you'll see different spellings in, the, in, in studies of the Inca world where sometimes a Q is used and sometimes a K is used. Now the Q is, is when authors are choosing to use a Quechua style of writing the name, okay? And, and the K is when it's a, a, a kind of modern usage of, of terminology. Okay, so I'm, I'm choosing to use Kori Kancha with a Q here. So what was this central building and what exactly did it, did it house inside? Um, like the Temple Mayor, this was considered a kind of axis mundi point in the Inca Empire, okay? Um, it was located in, we can go back to the map here of, oops, Here we go, we can go back to the map to see that we're actually talking about a kind of a, a different location here. Also extremely um, mountainous and high and we know that the outside of the Coricancha oops, was probably, um, scholars think it was probably emblazoned with gold shields on the outside of it. So it would have shone like it would have sh um, it would have had a kind of glimmer like an luminosity like the sun, a kind of hammered gold <laughs> exterior. That's yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and now there's an idea that it, um, again this this is a kind of oops a ceremonial center that that is symbolic, okay, and would have been um, would have been used only for ceremonial purposes, okay? And inside of it, and here, here we can actually see some of the different, this gives us a sense of some of the external walls of it with the, the church that's predominantly on top of it. But the idea again that you're building in the landscape to mimic the kind of natural world behind you. So many of um, Inca sites are designed to mimic the, the architecture is designed to mimic the natural landscape beyond it, behind it, which we have here. Unfortunately, we, I actually don't have a photograph of what that would look like, but one can, one can imagine. Okay. Inside the Cancha, 
and outside in different areas, we know that the Inca produced symbolic gardens made with silver and gold maize cobs. So you talked about the importance of corn here. Yes, in the Inca world, we have a kind of veneration of the idea of corn. And we know that there were stylized gardens made of golden objects, if you can imagine. So a whole symbolic garden constructed of golden silv silver and gold maize cobs, which is just fantastic. So again, we have the idea of a precious metal Okay, being significant, the idea of a kind of luminosity, the idea of a color, and the idea of, of it being connected to an agriculture, agricultural thing, object, that helped the civilization flourish as well. So all of that in terms of being embedded into, into one central ceremonial location. And let me and actually put on your list, I will pull up various site images of the Kodi Kancha and Cusco so that it's, we have more here. How large were these gardens? This was, the, the garden was vast. We know, it was, and we don't, we don't, we have very few remnants. So we have silver and gold cobs that have ended up in museum collections, and we have descriptions from colonial sources describing these golden gardens. But inside the structure? Or outside, outside, yeah. Cool. Yeah. But it makes sense why they would be taken off and... Right. And melted down. Oftentimes, especially the Spaniards, took all of the gold you know, materials they found to melt down when they, during the conquest. Right. Um, just so yeah. that I know, you've got Inca with a K. Is that also something that's changing? Yes. It, well, yeah. Inca with a C is, has been the Spanish usage with a K, the Quechua. Got it. Yeah. OK. Lastly, before we get out of here, I just want to introduce, and I, and I can supplement this in a Dropbox um, folder of images. We have the site of Machu Picchu, okay? Um, a mountain which is a mountainous okay, region that um, was located 7,970 feet above sea level, located in the Cusco region, okay? It's situated on a mountain ridge above, the, above what's called the Sacred Valley, which is 50 miles northwest of Cusco, so where we were just at and through which the Urubamba River flows. Most archaeologists and scholars believe Machu Picchu was built as an estate for the Inca Emperor Pachacuti, okay? P-A-C-H-A-C-U-T-I, who reigned between 1438 and 1472. Often it's called the lost city of the Incas, which it wasn't. Pachacuti, P-A-C-H-A-C-U-T-I. It's become really the most familiar icon of Inca civilization. But there was nothing lost about it, and it was like, likely a kind of, um, again, a kind of residential complex for the emperor. The Incas built the estate around 1450, but it was abandoned a century later at the time of the Spanish conquest. Although known locally, it was not known to the Spanish during the colonial period and remained unknown to the outside world until it was brought to attention in 1911 by the American historian Hiram Bingham, who was a Yale explorer and <laughs> looter <laughs> as well. But he, he actually, um, it was only in 1911 that it was largely came to the attention of the outside world, even though, of course, locals always knew about it. So nothing really discovered about it except to a, Western, to a Western audience in that sense. Since then, Machu Picchu has become the largest tourist attraction in South America. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it, yeah, okay. <laughs> you might be able to speak about your experience and... Lots of people, and we read them, we were there about four years ago, mm -hmm. that um, so many people are coming that they're thinking about the limiting the numbers and mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds of people. Yeah. Right. And one actually, I mean, if, you know, I, I, I haven't been, but I would imagine that taking the, the train to get there gives you some sense of what travails it must have taken to get there during Inca times in terms of the kind of labor of, of getting outside of Cusco into the landscape to, to get there. Um, by 1976, 30% of Machu Picchu has been restored, and the restoration process is in, it continues to today. Okay. To just give you some sense, again, and here this is 
This is a classic site where people talk about the mimicking of structures with a landscape, which in different views of it you'll be able to see, but it's also the sacredness of the idea of mountains and rock. And here we have different kinds of rock walls that become, and here I'm just showing you again the importance of stonework to the Inca. And also the Inca are known, uh, unlike the Aztec um, or any of the Mesoamerican cultures we've been talking about, in terms of artistic style, most Andean cultures favor abstraction as a principle. This idea of the non-figurative. Abstract designs, geometric designs, things that are largely more conceptual than iconographic, okay? Which has been a big debate in pre-Columbian studies. Here I'm just showing you different um, indications of the, of the monumentality of rock walls. Yeah, and the importance of why, of why Carolyn Dean wrote a book on, on stones. Why stones are so important. How did they move them? Hmm? How did they move them? Right. And Incredible labor. Stones? Incredible labor. Are they from, from the same site? They're yeah. largely from regions right around there that they're built with. Why are they building all these walls? These are largely part of, ceremony, of a ceremonial complex that we have remnants of it that are being restored now, of a residential, residential palace. Oops. Right, right, no mortar is used. So, I mean, you can literally, the, yeah, the virtuosity of stonework is unlike probably anything in the world in terms of the use of, the use of stone. And stones were deified. We have colonial sources where stones are considered alive, again. So these are objects that are living, living things. Okay, our last set of objects. <laughs> um, this might be our last object, is it? Okay, here, um, like we've been talking about with um, every culture so far, so far, the idea is that the clothes make who you are. What you wear makes who you are. Whether that's the fabric, um, the attire, the deity impersonation, the jewelry, the things that you put on your body are part of, of, of your kind of identification. And here I'm showing you um, an Inca tunic um, from 1450 to 1540 made of camelid fiber and cotton, okay? And... Is that the same animal that we saw? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll show you, I brought in this guy. Here we go. <laughs> so a camelid would have been similar to this. Yeah, yeah. And all, you know, fabrics and textiles are some of the most important kinds of um, artistic objects coming out of the Indian world and largely being appreciated more and more today by historians and anthropologists. There's a move to understand um, textiles in a way that there hasn't been in, in the last few decades. There's a, really a return to, to an appreciation of it as a craft that was dominated predominantly by women, okay, um, and that was extremely important in the tribute system in the Indian world. The idea of producing cloth and producing textiles for people that held different ranks and different hierarchies within the Inca Empire. Okay. So depending on who you were and your importance, you had a particular textile design associated with your particular office in life. Okay. So there, there are intricate discussions of the kinds of textiles that different military leaders would, would wear or people from different regions of the empire, so on and so forth. So um, they're, they're, um, they were extremely important. And here I brought in a 16th century quote just to give you some sense of this. The men came out and dressed in garments of fine wool woven with gold. On their necks they brought out some bags also of elaborately woven wool. The women also came out dressed very richly in cloaks and sashes that they called chumbis, well woven with gold and with fine gold fasteners, large pins and about two palms long, which they called topos. And this idea then that um, in, in all of, of colonial images, you really see people, people being demarcat, demarcated out by the patterns on the textiles they are wearing. So it becomes a way of identifying who you are and your kind of rank, right? And here, here I'm actually showing the, the importance of textiles and weaving in the Peruvian Andes is something that is charted out actually in Juan Poma's um, chronicle. This is a 16th century Spanish chronicle produced with um, Native American, you know, an art, a Native American, a Quechua artist 
who's actually showing us in a way a woman working, um, producing a textile here, and showing us in a way the act of what it means to do that. And there was a special class of women who produced textiles. Okay, so there's a whole class of, and it was extremely important. And we know that there are burials and bundles that are solely textiles um, that have been found by anthropologists across the region. Okay. I will, um, we can put on the list, I could actually, I actually have a source that breaks down the meaning of each geometric design that I think will be really useful for students to show what they, what they were connected to and what they mean. How do you say that? Al Tukapu Tunic. I believe the designs indicated everything, but I'll, I'll give you a breakdown of one of the graphs of some of the textile work that's been done because your whole identity could be broken down by the kinds of geometric designs that you wore, especially within the military. So, so they're, they're really, they're fabulous pieces, they're really intricate, and they're largely absolutely abstract. So again, this idea of the abstraction of knowledge that's completely non-iconographic. We don't have images of animals or people here, right? We have images that are, that are based on patterns and lines that match the kinds of designs we see in architectural complexes as well. So a different aesthetic system is at work. To yeah, the Kenti cloth. Mm, yeah. And then one of the works that we have that's modern is a um, Ellen work that yeah. works like Kenti Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he does great work. And what's interesting is there's a whole movement in fashion design in Peru today to create high fashion that mimics textiles from the Inca Empire. So there, I actually saw just a, a fashion shoot recently where um, models were actually, artists were using you know, models and, and showing um, Inca designs in elaborate ways for the runway. So there's a, there's a kind of return now to the idea of appreciating these abstract designs. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.